Um, as you've heard, my name is John Karanja. I'm the founder of uh, Bitab Africa, and it's indeed a great pleasure to have you know you guys here today at this important uh, conference. Um, I would like to begin the conference by sort of giving a brief history of uh, blockchain in Kenya and Africa. And um, personally, I got into the bot uh, blockchain space back in 2014. Um, myself and my partner, Chris, who's also here, were running a startup called CrowdPesa, and we were developing um, an M-commerce platform on top of mobile money and Pesa. And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, um, you know, the startup life, especially in Kenya, is very hard. Access to capital, access to resources, trying to get a meeting with a big corporate company to get integrations, it's a pain, right? So um, we ran the startup for about two years. Then guess what happened? We ran out of money, right? And um, around that time, um, I think Chris found a conference called AfriCoin. It was at the IHUB. We, we went for the conference, and uh, they were talking about something called Bitcoin. And when we saw Bitcoin, we were like, I wish we knew about this like two months ago when we were still running the startup, because it was an interesting platform that we could have leveraged to you know, um, integrate uh, payments onto our platform. So personally, um, I've seen the last two years that we've been running BitHub a tremendous growth in the adoption of um, Bitcoin technology. Um, I mean, some of the early buds uh, are here, and we used to have meetings of five people, ten people. And today you have, you know, hundreds of people coming to events, and a lot of events happening simultaneously across the country. So, um, if you look at um, the amount of Bitcoin traded on um, local Bitcoins, um, it's about 100 million shillings a week, right? And um, we face some challenges. I, I'm sure you all know about the Central Bank of Kenya's warning against cryptocurrencies, um, which has made it difficult for people to use banks to you know, buy and sell Bitcoin. Uh, I'm sure you'll be getting into uh, more of this through the conference. So we need to figure out a way where we can turn Nairobi and uh, Kenya into one of those blockchain hubs we saw. Uh, Dubai, uh, Zurich, Berlin. And Nairobi needs to be right up there because we are the first people to develop uh, digital currency on the mobile phone, M-Pesa. So we should also be the first people or among the first people to adopt this technology and use it for you know, the different solutions that you'll be hearing about today. So I think today we have a lineup of great presentations. We'll look at crypto wealth management. Um, we'll have a keynote from Bitangen Demo, who was recently appointed the chairman of the blockchain and AI task force by the president of Kenya. So I think we should clap for that, because that, that's a fast uh, across the world. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit to different conferences, and um, um, there's a lot of progress, there's a lot of investment going into blockchain, but very few countries have government support, which is something that we should leverage as, as a country. So we'll also have another keynote on uh, demystifying blockchain in Africa. Um, as you know, in Africa, we have a lot of challenges um, across key sectors like agriculture, health. How can we deploy the blockchain to solve problems in those key areas? Uh, we'll also have a look at um, blockchain and businesses. How can blockchain be used to empower businesses? And then we'll look at the social economic impact of, of blockchain. So I really want to invite you guys to engage and you know, try and discuss and uh, we figure out together how we can grow this um, space uh, going forward. So I'll go straight into my presentation, and I'll be focusing on scaling blockchain applications uh, with a look at African use cases. So um, to really understand 
a blockchain, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, you need to ask, what is money, right? And I'm sure, you know, economists in the room, they'll tell us money is a store of value, money is a medium of exchange, uh, and money is a unit of account. So a store of value, when you keep, you know, 10,000 shillings in your bank account or on your M-Pesa phone, um, you expect that 10,000 shillings to be able to pay your rent, right? You don't expect it to be volatile, you expect it to keep and maintain its value. Um, medium of exchange, when you go to a shop, you expect to be able to use your M-Pesa, not another currency. And then unit of account, um, if you expect to you know, be able to tell you how much money you owe the government in taxes, or you know, how much money goods are worth. But I would like to also say that money is a language to express value. Money is a language. So, if you look at the digital disruption, right? Um, in the olden days, I mean, in, and I, th I think even today, we still have uh, people who consider cattle as wealth. In fact, most African communities consider cattle, cattle as wealth because you can use it to pay. Any gas? Dowry. The ladies know. So, when you're negotiating dowry, you're usually told, pay 13 herd of cattle, right? So, that means that the cattle is an expression of value. Right? We're not saying, we're not equating women to cattle, but it's a language being used to express a certain value. Then, um, if you look at commodities in the Roman Empire, um, the, for a long time, they used salt as, um, as, as money or um, as, a, as an expression of value to trade um, because salt was limited in supply. There was some scarcity. Uh, you could not easily access salt um, until they discovered uh, salt mines that were quite close by and sort of salt depreciated as a, as a, as a means for, for exchange. Then we had uh, virtual currencies. You have bonga points. So today you can go to a Safaricom shop and actually buy a phone with bonga points, right? I remember when I was younger, um, we used to steal bonga points from our parents' phones and then go get some discount at, at Safaricom. So bonga points are virtual currency. Virtual currencies are not new. They've been there for a long time. You have travel miles. Uh, Kenya Airways gives you air miles when you travel. So that just shows that the idea of virtual currency has been there for some time. Then you have digital currency. For those of you who know how M-Pesa started, um, they discovered that people were using airtime to exchange uh, value, to, you know, to pay each other. So you know, some clever person decided to make it into a fully-fledged application. And M-Pesa today is uh, backed on a one-to-one -one basis with the Kenya shilling. Then you come to the controversial cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So um, how, how many of you have sort of used Bitcoin or downloaded a Bitcoin wallet? Wow, that's uh, half the room. Um, and um, Bit Bitcoin came around in 2009 uh, during the financial crisis. Um, so Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, we don't know if it's a he, she, or a they. Uh, they uh, he wrote a white paper detailing a concept for digital money that can be sent over the internet. And um, it's almost 10 years. It will be 10 years on January 3rd next year uh, that Bitcoin has been in existence. So why Bitcoin? Right? What is the importance of Bitcoin? Why do we need Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the world's first censorship-resistant, peer-to-peer digital currency for transferring value over a network. It doesn't have to be the internet, but the internet is the biggest network we know. You could use radio communication waves to transmit Bitcoin. But the key thing to note is that it's censorship-resistant. So if I have Bitcoin, I can send you Bitcoin without involving any intermediary, like a bank or even a central bank, right? And that is very powerful because it allows people to communicate money. Remember, money is an expression of value between each other um, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. 
So Bitcoin has evolved into what we call the internet of value. And um, um, I mean, there, there are many reasons why I believe it will become the internet of value. Um, and these are the key sort of aspects that uh, have made Bitcoin successful. In fact, I would argue a blockchain platform is not really useful if it does not have these four characteristics. And the first characteristic is the protocol. The protocol is the set of rules used to govern how Bitcoin works, how Bitcoin tokens are transacted across the network, right? So people say Bitcoin is not regulated. Um, that's actually not true. Bitcoin is the most regulated system on Earth. It is regulated by mathematics. And in mathematics, you know, one plus one will always equal two. So these are the things that um, have been sort of um, cleverly intertwined within the Bitcoin protocol um, to create number one scarcity. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins, uh, Bitcoin units. And um, they are, the way they are mined is set up in a, in a, in a protocol. Then you have the blockchain, which is um, a very key aspect. It's one that allows us to innovate which is the distributed open ledger that stores transactions and is secured by the miners. We won't go into the miners today. That's like a whole lecture by itself. But th this is very important because the Bitcoin blockchain is immutable. Transactions that are stored on the blockchain cannot be changed. Yeah? They cannot be changed with the resources we have today on the planet uh, because it's, it's very expensive to change a Bitcoin transaction. And um, the reason is because it uses something called proof of work, where you use electricity to sort of hash the transactions onto the blockchain ledger. And uh, you need a lot of electricity to reverse the, the transaction. Then you have the currency. The currency is very controversial, which is the digital token used for transactions to reward the miners and also used for people to spend and do transactions. Then you have the software. Um, the software is open source. So today, any developer can download the software, look at it, and even duplicate it and create even their own coin. So if there are about there are thousands of cryptocurrencies that have been created because Bitcoin is open source. And um, that has sort of allowed for you know, innovation in different uh, aspects. So this is actually what is key. Um, you've all heard of protocols, network-centric protocols. Network-centric protocols are protocols that um, are governed by rules and operate, operate on a distributed network. So all of you, I'm sure today, used the HTTP protocol when you browse the website, um, used email, SMTP, um, and obviously used TCP IP, which is the backbone uh, protocol for transmission of data. And the data could be email, it could be images, it could be websites over the internet. So what Bitcoin has done is it has added the missing piece. This is a puzzle, and there's one missing piece, the transaction of value over the network. And that's what um, the last piece Bitcoin does today. So, of course, there are challenges. Um, it's not been uh, smooth sailing. Um, th there's been a lot of um, sort of debate on how to scale Bitcoin. But um, um, because of its censorship resistant, those debates tend to be ironed out pretty uh, efficiently. So, um, one aspect of the open source software, which is very important, to us as entrepreneurs, as startups, if you remember my story, is open and permissionless innovation. So today, any one of you, and there are some of you in the room who are doing this, can take the idea to market at the global level through using uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchain. You do not need permission from any sort of uh, gatekeeper. Um, to, um, you know, to transact or to integrate your application. And uh, the Bitcoin project has 500 contributors 
who contribute to it. And some of these guys are the best uh, minds in the world, the people who, inv who invented cryptography protocols uh, that we use on the internet. They're all sort of uh, looking at Bitcoin. So in terms of uh, sort of the economics and the socioeconomic dynamics of, of Bitcoin, you, you have an ecosystem where minor, miners are key. Miners are in the middle. They create the coins through processing transactions. Um, the coins go to the speculators, the people who now who are trading. Um, in Kenya, it's, it's about a million dollars a week. The speculators determine the price. Yeah? And uh, that's why you find Bitcoin is very volatile. When the speculators are happy, it's going up. When they're not so happy, they're crashing it down. And um, it's a free market. So that's why you find that um, uh, any set of bad news can negatively affect the price, and any set of good news can positively affect the price. Then you have now the applications, which is the space that I like, the space that Bitab Africa plays in. The innovations that will change lives for um, you know, people who don't necessarily understand the technology, but can benefit tremendously from it. And uh, that's, those ap applications are built on the blockchain. So you can have uh, land title registries, uh, which the government is you know, trying to do. Um, you can have ID systems on the blockchain. You can have uh, driving licenses on the blockchain. I'm sure we'll hear about, more about that today. So there are a lot of innovations that uh, can be done using the, the blockchain. So um, this is um, an old map. This is 2014. Each red dot represents a Bitcoin application download. And in 2014, most of the, you can actually even tell where people live on the planet, by where the dots are. Uh, but <laughs> mo you can see most of the, you know, Western, Asian uh, world, it's like fully red, like China and India, totally red. Because um, they, they were early adopters. In Africa, you have, I believe, Ghana, you have a bit in Kenya, um, Nigeria, and South Africa. Um, but I'm happy to say that I've not found a recent image of this. You'd see a lot of red in Kenya today. So the, the world has been racing to adopt this technology uh, because it represents one of the key moments. Um, I think Bitangen Demo always talks about um, technology leaps, transitions from, from you know, uh, the telephone to the personal computer, to the internet, to the mobile phone. So this is one of those uh, tra transitions. So um, I think one of the things that we found out through research is there is convergence of technology. And this is why it's very important for us, especially young people, to get involved in blockchain technology. Because we already know that between AI and IoT, a lot of the jobs that we have today, or the jobs that the government is hoping to create, they're not going to come. Because machines will be much better at doing those jobs than you know, uh, humans. Um, and IoT will, will make sure that um, you know, uh, you don't need manual processes to, you know, whether you're doing logistics or whether you're doing um, accounting. That will be done uh, by using these technologies. So the, the point in the middle is the sweet spot. How can we figure out how to use blockchain? Because now blockchain gives you the opportunity and the freedom to innovate. And how can we leverage off AI and IoT given that uh, we don't have too many resources. Resources here are scarce. So we can sort of optimize how we develop our applications using those three uh, key technologies. So this is an example of IoT mixed with blockchain. So this is our website. Um, the lady, she's buying some beans for her pet. She has a little bird. And she's paying for it using uh, Bitcoin, right? And um, so she's opening her wallet. She, she says pay. The minute she clicks pay, beans are 
this past, and the little bird goes and gets the, the beans. So in that transaction, there was no bank, there was no visa, there was no PayPal in the middle. It was all on the blockchain. And um, it used, a, that's a Raspberry Pi, it's a small computer. So it was an integration between uh, cryptocurrency and IoT, and uh, you have the little bird getting its, its, its food. And that, that's an example of what you can do with uh, e-commerce uh, using the blockchain and integrating blockchain into um, you know, different uh, supply systems. So um, that was made possible by something we call Lightning, um, and it allows for microtransactions. So maybe those beans cost maybe half a shilling. So what, what's the minimum transaction fee on M-Pesa? Does anyone know? Um, yeah, it should be like 10 bob. So with, with traditional financial systems, you cannot have micropayments. But with cryptocurrencies, you can have microtransactions. So if in, in Kenya, we have a lot of places where we have the Kadogo economy, where people, they, they optimize the money they have, they buy what they need for a day, for an hour. So these technologies can help us sort of optimize even more and have people climbing up the, the ladder because they're more efficient in how they use uh, resources. So at Bitab Africa, we try to motivate guys to disrupt, how to move ideas to concept. And uh, we have a resident startup, they're called Bitmari. Um, they're based in Zimbabwe. And Bitmari actually is probably the first company in the world to get a license from a central bank, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, to transact uh, money from the diaspora, from UK and US into Zimbabwe, using Bitcoin, right? So in Zimbabwe, they have a more progressive policy on using this technology because of the challenges they've had with their own uh, currencies. They're, they're now using a mix of the dollar, the South African rand, and the Botswana pula. So um, he, he was able to set up a farmer accelerator, so crowdfund money from people in the diaspora who are looking for investments, use the blockchain to, tra to track those transactions, send money to the farmers. The farmers, you know, they do their thing, they farm the crops, they will send back the profit uh, to, to the investors. So that's a classic example of showing how you can link people who have resources in the diaspora to people who don't have resources. And it's only possible. You cannot do this with Western Union. Western Union will take at least 10% of, of the money. If you're trying to move money from um, you know, the, the US to, to Zimbabwe. Um, one project that we are working on at BitHub, we're doing some research with a local university, is how to harness the free energy we have, solar energy. We have a lot of sun in Africa, and uh, turn it into um, cryptocurrencies, and uh, possibly um, using IoT again, using solar panels, create um, another resource that farmers can benefit from. Farmers, they farm crops, but they can also farm um, you know, the sun, solar energy. Um, and in future, this could also um, allow for what we call microgrids. In fact, there was, a, there was a case, I think a few days ago in the paper, where somebody was setting up a, a microgrid in, I think, Homa Bay. Then, um, uh, I mean, his, his solar panel was disconnected. So, I mean, that just shows you that there's interest in, in moving in this direction. So yeah, that's our partnership. Um, and then now I come to the controversial topic of ICOs, right? You guys have all heard of ICOs. Um, so ICOs are probably, it's a story of last year and also this year, about $4 billion was raised through an ICO. ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. It's similar to the IPO that um, like the Nairobi Securities Exchange would do. And uh, people have raised uh, $4 billion in one year. Uh, VCs, I think, 
maybe the investments we see made in the same year were about one, one billion dollars. So ICOs are doing four times what VCs are doing. So they've been disrupted by, by, uh, by blockchain. Um, of course, there are a lot of issues. It's not all rosy. There are a lot of scams. Um, so there's a lot of um, sort of uh, misdirection. So there is need for some sort of regulation or some sort of um, clarity in how ICOs can be run. But this could be a very useful tool to raise money for companies and startups that don't have the ability to you know, raise money on their own. They could use ICOs um, to raise money from around the world for their, for their unique ideas. So uh, we've, done, we've done some research. Um, we published this, I think, last year. Um, it just gives you a breakdown of, of, of what we think the opportunities are with blockchain in, in, in Africa. Um, you can just visit the blockchainopportunity.com. Um, if you use the coupon code Proudly African, you'll download it for free. So the coupon code is Proudly African in capital letters. And um, essentially, we cover all areas on how cryptocurrencies and blockchain can be useful from our perspective in the near future in, um, in Africa. So those are my, our details. If you want to engage, the best way to engage us is actually through social media, through Telegram, um, and uh, our Twitter channel. And uh, we look forward to um, you know, working with you guys um, and taking blockchain to the next level in Kenya and Africa. Thank you very much.